This is the video for books two and three of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. We're going to cover four topics, practical wisdom, acrasia, incontinence and continence, and courage and temperance. So our first topic is uh, practical wisdom. So we'll go to page 31 of the reading. Uh, so this comes up all throughout these two books and all throughout the entirety of the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, I've just picked this page because it shows up here. Uh, Aristotle is talking about virtue being a state involving rational choice, consisting in a mean relative to us and determined by reason. The reason, that is, by reference to which the practically wise person would determine it. So Aristotle's account of virtue is an account which involves reason in a lot of ways. You see some of this in books two and three and more of it in the later books. And so for Aristotle, part of being virtuous involves uh, using your rationality, being reasonable. And specifically, he talks about this in terms of using practical wisdom or being practically wise. So what does this mean? What does he have in mind by practical wisdom? So the important thing to realize is that practical wisdom and rationality and reason as they involve a virtue is as distinct from what we might call theoretical wisdom or impractical wisdom. Theoretical wisdom is about sort of theoretical things or scientific things or things you can read in a book uh, it's the kind of wisdom you'll get from taking classes at Ashoka. It's the kind of wisdom you can get uh, from reading the books that you'll read uh, in your courses. Theoretical wisdom is the sort of wisdom we usually refer to as just wisdom. We often just say wisdom, and by this we mean theoretical wisdom. That's interesting stuff, and Aristotle has stuff to say about it, but it's not very relevant to books two and three, or to the Nicomachean ethics broadly, or to ethics broadly for Aristotle. For Aristotle, the kind of wisdom that is relevant to ethics is practical wisdom. Practical wisdom is not about theoretical stuff. It's about how to do things. It's practical. So practical is about doing things or taking action. And being practically wise or having practical wisdom means you know how to do things. You know the right way to do things. So somebody who knows how to sail a boat or uh, hit a ball um, or cook a meal, they are practically wise. It's not theoretical wisdom. Knowing how to sail a boat is not something you can read about in a book. Uh, knowing how to hit a ball is not something you can learn from reading a book. Uh, knowing how to cook food is not something you can learn from reading a book, at least not entirely. These are sort of practical skills their practical wisdom that you can only acquire by doing and by practicing. And this is the kind of wisdom that's relevant to virtue. You cannot become virtuous by reading about it in a book. I'm a moral philosophy professor. I have a lot of theoretical knowledge about ethics. I know lots and lots of stuff about ethics. This doesn't necessarily mean I have practical wisdom because practical wisdom is knowing how to put something into practice. It's about knowing how to do things and when to do things and why to do things. So I might know a lot about ethics, but if I don't know how to be ethical myself, and specifically, if I don't know how to get myself to act ethically, if I don't know how to make myself act ethically, I don't have practical wisdom. No matter how much you know about swinging a bat and hitting a ball, if you don't know how to get yourself to actually hit the ball, if you don't know the actual movements you have to take to hit the ball, you lack practical wisdom. So this is the relevant kind of wisdom for Aristotle and his ethics. And we want to keep close track of this as we read through the whole Nicomachean Ethics, as we read through books two and three, and as we go on uh, in philosophy, because wisdom is going to play an important role for Kant too, and I mean everybody that we end up reading, and then we'll want to ask, to what extent is it practical wisdom? To what extent is it not? For Aristotle, it's very clearly practical wisdom. It's knowing how to get yourself to do things. If you can't get yourself to do something, if you can't sail the boat or hit the ball, or in the case of ethics, 
act virtuously, then you don't have practical wisdom. Knowing sort of how, like, in principle what to do, that's not practical wisdom. You have to be able to get yourself to actually do the thing. So that is practical wisdom, and that's very crucial for Aristotle's account. And so now we know what that means. Topics number two through four are going to make more sense after you've done the reading. So you may want to return to these sections of the video after you've done the reading. But uh, topic number two is acrasia. People also sometimes say acrasia. I don't really know what the right way. I think acrasia is maybe whatever. Uh, so this is a Greek word. We often translate it as weakness of will or incontinence. And I mention it here because uh, it's going to come up a fair amount in books two and three. So if we go to page 39, um, Aristotle notes, everything done through ignorance is non-voluntary. What does this mean? So everything done through ignorance, so stuff that you do sort of without practical wisdom, sort of not knowing something, something that you do but lacking some sort of knowledge, is non-voluntary. So you don't actually mean to do it. You're not doing it on purpose. And that's a strange claim. Why can't I do something on purpose even though I'm ignorant? And much of book three is devoted to sort of examining this kind of claim and related claims about ignorance and voluntariness and things like this. Right now, we're just gonna look at one sort of topic, which is acrasia. Acrasia, or weakness of will, is when you know what the right thing to do is, but you don't do it. So you're facing a situation where uh, it's easy to cheat on a test, and you know you shouldn't cheat on the test. You say it would be wrong to cheat on the test, but you cheat on the test. And acrasia is a puzzle to a lot of philosophers. Why? Because they say, look, if you know what the right thing to do is, then why don't you just do it? Like, what's stopping you? What's holding you back? And then the thought is, well, look, if acrasia is possible, if you can know the right thing to do, but then not do it, then this means maybe your actions sort of aren't under your control. You're not really voluntarily acting. Something else is driving you. If you were in control, you'd do the right thing. And so this kind of phrase, everything done through ignorance is non-voluntary, that's one kind of thought, which is, oh, if you don't know the right thing to do, then maybe it's not voluntary. Acrasia is a different kind of thought, which is, if you do know the right thing to do, but you still don't do it, maybe that's non-voluntary also. Some philosophers deny that acrasia is even possible. They say, look, if you know what the right thing to do is, you'll do it. Whenever you do the wrong thing, it's because you've made some mistake. That kind of view is one that Aristotle spends a lot of time discussing, and we'll get Aristotle's view on acrasia in book three, and it's kind of complicated. But what I'm doing here in this video is just introducing this kind of idea, which is knowing the right thing to do, but then failing to do it. And is it possible? Is it not possible? There's disagreement, and Aristotle weighs in. So similarly related to acrasia is our next topic, which are continence and incontinence. Again, these come up a lot in the reading, and so this will make perhaps more sense once you've done the reading. But if we zoom down to 41, uh, the incontinent person acts from appetite, but not from rational choice while the self-controlled person does the contrary and acts from rational choice, but not from appetite. So self-controlled here is also another way of saying continent. And so an incontinent person acts from appetite, not from rational choice. So they have a sort of appetite for one thing and they act on that rather than on their rational choice. In a way, they are acratic or exhibiting acrasia. Why? Because their rational choice maybe knows what the right thing to do is, but their appetite gets them to do something else. So you see the cake and you know the right thing to do is not to eat the cake, 
because it's bad for you, but then your appetite gets you to eat the cake. So you are incontinent. You act from your appetite, not from your rational choice. Meanwhile, the continent person does the contrary. They act from rational choice, but not from appetite. So they see the cake, and they really want the cake. Their appetite makes them want the cake. But they say, no, it's not good for me. I'm not going to eat the cake. So why are these two kinds of people important? Well, Aristotle contrasts both of these people with the virtuous person. The virtuous person, their appetite and their rational choice are both correct. The incontinent person has the right rational choice and the wrong appetite. They say, I shouldn't eat the cake. And, or sorry, the incontinent person has the right rational choice and the wrong appetite, and they act on the wrong appetite. They eat the cake. The continent person has the, ro the right rational choice and the wrong appetite, but they do better than the incontinent person. They act on the right rational choice, so at least they don't eat the cake. But Aristotle says, look, they're both deficient. The virtuous person is better than both of them. The virtuous person has the right appetite and the right rational choice. They're aligned in the virtuous person. The virtuous person is not incontinent. They don't do the wrong thing. They're not even continent. They don't do the right thing, but sort of feel bad about it and go against their appetite. The virtuous person has the right appetite, so they don't experience a conflict. The continent person has a conflict, but the right side wins out. The incontinent person has a conflict, and the wrong side wins out. The virtuous person has no conflict. The virtuous person says, I don't want that cake. That cake is bad for me. I also know that cake is bad for me. So they don't have the appetite, and they have the correct rational choice. So that's kind of an interesting view of virtue. You could have a different view of virtue. We'll see Kant has a different view of virtue later. So finally, courage and temperance. So you'll notice when you read book two, and especially book three, Aristotle spends a lot of time discussing courage and temperance. These are the two main virtues that he examines in these books. The rest of Nicomachean Ethics examines other virtues. The reading quiz does not spend a lot of time on courage or temperance, especially the latter part of book three, which is a deep examination of courage and temperance. There's not a lot of that on the reading quiz. That's not because it's unimportant. Uh, it's because the reading quiz was getting kind of long. And moreover, courage and temperance are sort of illustrations of the principles that Aristotle is introducing in book two and book three. So he says, this is how virtue works, and this is how voluntariness and continence works, and practical wisdom works, and so on, and the mean, which we'll look at. And I'm going to illustrate this by going through courage and temperance and showing how these virtues work. So you shouldn't skip or skim this stuff. This is all very important, but it's important both in itself, it's interesting to see what Aristotle has to say about courage and temperance, but also as a way of helping to understand the system and illustrating the principles of the system that you've learned earlier in books two and three and which the reading quiz spends more time on. So this is just in a sort of exhortation not to skim over the courage and temperance stuff. It's interesting both in itself to learn about courage and temperance and Aristotle's approach to that, but also as an applied version of the system which he sets out in sort of theoretical terms earlier. So he says, oh, you know, virtue is about choosing the mean or virtue is about acting in the right way. But then it's like, well, what exactly does this mean? And then he tells you what it means with courage and temperance here and then with more later in the book. So uh, keep those in mind. Maybe revisit uh, acrasia and continence and incontinence when you, um, after you've already read uh, the uh, books two and three. And I'll see you in class.